overseers and like members of the Senate Judiciary Committee. And as you can imagine, there is a crowd here. Um, you're also being taped. Uh, they can't see you, but they can hear you. So um, we're going to start with uh, Mike um, O'Grady, who's going to go over the Crawford ruling and then uh, hear from you uh, on your views of the Crawford ruling and how okay. it Im might impact. Our main concern is how does the Crawford ruling, if any, impact S-37? All right. Which, as you know, the governor vetoed. So Mike's going to try to go over the differences between the two bills with us. I mean, okay. the, the differences between the judge's decision and S-37 has passed the Senate and House and vetoed by the governor. All right. Thank you, Senator. I'm going to put my phone on mute. Okay. Uh, until um, they're, they're ready for me. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Mike O'Grady with Legislative Council. You should all have in your folder uh, a document that looks like this. Well, I think we will pick up all the documents for today. Okay. Right here. Sorry. So, yeah, there's a paper clip of all the documents for today. So, this is the right one. Yeah. Oh, 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 it's just because there were so many. Yeah, it's it's the one it. I gave you yesterday, Senator Chair. Yep. Right. What is it? Oh. All right. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So I'm going to be working off of this. Just as general background, you all know um, of the PFOA PFAS contamination that was discovered in Bennington, in Bennington area. You know that uh, persons who were exposed or who had um, monitoring that, that discovered or testing that discovered PFOA in their bloodstream uh, brought uh, litigation against San Govan um, for, among other things, they were seeking an injunction uh, to require uh, San Govan to implement a uh, testing program um, for uh, medical conditions that may, might arise from or due to PFOA contamination. At the same time the litigation was ongoing, you, uh, this body, uh, worked through S37 which would have uh, authorized a cause of action for the remedy of medical monitoring for those persons who were exposed to a toxic substance due to the tortious conduct of a person who owned or operated a large facility. Now, that is effectively what we're talking about here. Um, Judge Crawford issued a decision December 27th in which he uh, addressed whether or not medical monitoring could be allowed as a remedy in the cause of action. Uh, and he established a test, or at least the beginnings of a test, <coughs> to be used to determine if medical monitoring would be awarded in that litigation. He did not award medical monitoring. He has yet to apply the facts to the, the factors that he set out in his decision. Um, but he basically set the framework for how he was going to review that claim for injunction to require San Goban to establish medical testing for those that were exposed to PFOA um, from San Goban. So with that as the background, um, the court basically said one of the major questions is whether to allow medical monitoring, um, whether or not the plaintiff first suffered physical injury or illness. And that was a big part of S-37 last year. You said that a person could bring that cause of action for a remedy without a physical injury. And what the court did there in, in looking and determining whether physical injury was required, the court looked at Vermont law. They, he looked at the um, restatement of torts. Does everyone know what the restatement is? It's a, it's a treatise of law that's put together by the American Law Institute that summarizes common law around the country for a certain subject matter and in some cases certain jurisdictions. There is a restatement of tort 
And one of the things that the restatement of tort um, addresses is what is a physical injury. Um, in his analysis, uh, Judge Crawford looked at the restatement second of torts, um, which uh, has a provision in it that provides that um, That, the, that physical injury, section 15 of, of the restatement of tort section, it says bodily harm includes an, any alteration of the structure or function of any part of the body, um, regardless if there is harm or not. And I, I, that's a paraphrase, it's not the exact language. So ultimately what Crawford was saying is that, that he believes that the, the Vermont Supreme Court would follow the restatement second of tort and determine that there was a physical injury and that consequently you don't need to determine whether this is a new cause of action it's really just a potential remedy that's available to a person um, when they are harmed. Now that leads us to why this is in federal court. So federal courts have original jurisdiction over claims of over $75,000 in monetary value um, and when the citizens in the, in the case are from different states, different jurisdictions. And so you have the Vermont citizens here and you have San Govan who is headquartered elsewhere. And in diversity actions, courts are often asked to interpret state law. Look to what the state law is, where the claim arose, and, to, and apply that state law to the facts of the matter. Well, Judge Crawford looked at Vermont state law to see if there is an action for medical monitoring, for the remedy of medical monitoring. There is no specific state common law, and there is no state legislation that provides for the cause of action or remedy for medical monitoring. So what the court did, and what courts, federal courts often do when there isn't explicit precedent, is that they look to the body of Vermont law, statute, <coughs> court decisions, history of the court, and other jurisdictions to determine whether or not he believed that Vermont law, Vermont <coughs> courts, would allow um, a person to seek the remedy of medical monitoring without physical injury. And I won't go into an analysis of, of the court's um, analysis or a summary of the court's analysis. I will just say that, that uh, Judge Crawford was thorough. Um, he uh, was rational. He looked at um, as many sources of law as possible. Um, in making his decision. He even looked at your actions last year and the executive branch's responses to those actions. He said your actions were largely irrelevant um, because of the uncertainty of what the test would be. Um, and so ultimately, Judge Crawford ruled that um, yes, a person could seek the remedy of medical monitoring uh, without a physical, or when there, uh, there are the individuals asymptomatic, when they're, when they're not showing any physical manifestation of the In so doing, the court said that they were gonna follow the line of cases in West Virginia and Pennsylvania and identifying six elements for determining if medical monitoring should be awarded as a remedy. However, he did say it's premature to define the exact requirements. So that leaves open the discretion to the court to change that test, to change the six elements. But he did say that the list of factors provides clear guide to the plaintiff's burden of proof. So it's giving the plaintiffs a framework for how they will show uh, that they should be awarded medical monitoring, but 
he reserves the right to change those elements. In addition, he sta stated the trial evidence will be significant. We discussed this last year with S37 that a lot of the factors will require significant litigation and evidence provided on both sides. And he recognized that. Um, and he said the court and the parties have yet to resolve the issues which are questions for the court that he will decide uh, and the questions that will be decided by a jury verdict. So although this is providing and authorizing a person to seek medical monitoring without a physical injury, it is not fully resolved. The court may st establish some additional criteria and the court <coughs> is still going to work out what he is the judge is going to decide and what the jury is going to decide. Does anyone have any questions at this point? Yeah. Um, well, I'd like, and I'd maybe since Professor Romnell is listening in, I'd like to focus on what our options are. And, and I, I appreciate understanding the Crawford decision. Um, but to focus in on what our options are, and I, I may be missing some, but it, it, it appears that one option is to do nothing. Let the veto stand by the governor. Let the Crawford decision go wherever it goes in terms of appeal five, ten years down the road. Or it, you know, it, when he finally makes the whole decision based upon the, what the jury does um, in the St. Cobain case. And then the third option second option would be to override the governor's veto and have S-37 become Vermont law regarding medical monitoring. And then the third option would be to try to develop a new bill based upon the Crawford decision. Now, am I missing some option? No, I think that those are effectively your options. You do nothing, go to a veto override and have S-37 or attempt to have S-37 be the state law. Um, or do not go forward with the veto override on S-37 and draft a bill that is at least more in line with the Crawford decision. But I, I'm not going to, uh, you know, I, I realize that people would, some groups would like the benefit of the uh, exemption for small businesses and farms that are in the that are in S-37, but not in the Crawford decision, and like the benefit of some of the issues that are in the Crawford decision. But I, you know, I don't think you do a combination of both, making it more appealing um, to the groups who have tried to avoid, who would try to avoid dealing with what people in Bennington and North Bennington have gone through. Um, when you have a constituent come to you and talk to you about their fears for themselves and their families as a result of the contamination from St. Cobain. <clears throat> Frankly, all this mumbo jumbo goes out the window for me and says, don't these people deserve to have medical monitoring of their condition so that they can perhaps detect a cancer earlier and save their lives or their kids' lives or whomever. Now, these people did nothing wrong. Um, absolutely nothing wrong, and they were contaminated by this company. So I have very little sympathy for the businesses that try to claim, well, we're not responsible because um, we followed, you know, state law. I remind them that ChemFab, which was the original company, left Vermont because of environmental regulations. If they'd stayed longer, the contamination would have been more widespread and worse. I agree that the people in your area have a problem that needs to be addressed, and I think Judge Crawford has kept that issue alive by denying both sides summary judgment motions. What I've heard you Dick describe as mumbo jumbo, I have a touch tort law since first year in law school, and when I read the 37 page decision, I'm a lawyer, but my eyes started to gloss over because I'm just not familiar with that law, and it is extremely easy for anyone in the public to conclude that's just a bunch of legal mumbo-jumbo. 
But if I understand Judge Crawford's decision, he supports these folks getting a remedy. The only question is how they're going to be required to produce a case to get that remedy. And he's used, the beauty of his decision is he's got West Virginia and Pennsylvania as the legal precedent for how he wants to get there. So if I understand this correctly, and Michael, you correct me if I'm wrong, you're the expert, but we have two states that have criteria set forth, six criteria is laid out on page 30 of this decision. If we modify our legislation to incorporate that language, don't we at least have on the one hand, the remedy is out there for people to get relief, and also we have a legal mechanical setup, if you will. I'm trying to use as plain English language as I can to get out of the mumbo jumbo. We have a mechanical system in operation that is consistent with two other states. And my question, I guess, to you would be, wouldn't it be more likely that Vermont courts would follow that as well if we adopted that approach. This is where I so, go. So <clears throat> um, there's multiple precedent out there on medical monitoring I'm aware. Um, for those cases that allow medical monitoring without a physical injury. The Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and to an extent New Jersey cases are, are often relied on. The Pennsylvania Paley Rail Yard case was one of the first, um, so it's often referenced. So, without legislation guiding the Supreme Court, and with no the Vermont Supreme Court, and with no um, underlying state cases addressing the issue, the court would then do what courts do and look at their own law that exists, at uh, other state laws, at secondary sources like the restatement, um, and try to determine what the law of Vermont would be. Whether or not it's likely or more likely or not, that they would use Pennsylvania or West Virginia to Bauer or Cali cases. I, I, I can't say, but I would just say that they would basically have gone through the analysis that Crawford did. Whether or not they conclude they concluded the same or agreed with Crawford, I can't say. Well, wouldn't it be more likely that our own Supreme Court would look to the Second Circuit if the Second Circuit had a decision on point to guide them in the process? Well, if the Second Circuit had a decision on point, that would be wonderful. But they don't necessarily have a, they are, there are district court cases in New York, um, but I am unaware of a Second Circuit, Second Circuit case that specifically addresses whether or not medical monitoring, and whether or not you use the Paley or the Bauer test on that. The ultimate question is, Crawford has kept alive the remedy that I think the people in Bennington need to have. If I yeah, so but the correct. criteria for for um, achieving that remedy are different under the Crawford decision and under S thirty seven. I agree. The question is whether or not we should do something that is inconsistent with where the Second Circuit appears to be heading, at the same time doing what would be inconsistent with where West Virginia and Pennsylvania have gone. Well, and if, if it would help, I can try to address some of these issues. Uh, yeah, um, I'm happy to, to try to do that, um, but uh, would you prefer to answer the question? Make one thing clear. I brought up North Bennington and Bennington because that's where I live. They're, by the way, one town. There's a village of North Bennington, but it's part of the town of Bennington, so it's only one town. Um, 
they're not impacted by S37. S37 is not retroactive. So whatever we do would help St. Johnsbury or Danville or West. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to say something nasty. Um, so I just want to. But uh, so making that clear that that S37 does not impact my constituents in the sense that it won't control how they're treated, except that it uh, would send a signal to people in other parts of the state that we're prepared to learn from our mistakes and try to remedy the situation. So, so Senator Benny, tort law generally is state law. So even if the courts, the federal courts, say this is what the standard is, state courts still have the opportunity to disagree with that. The state Supreme Court is not required to follow the Crawford decision. Well, I didn't say so, they were. Pardon? I didn't suggest or mean to imply that they were. But I think looking at overall the Vermont Supreme <coughs> Court, what it looks to for precedent, it would only be natural for them to look at the Second Circuit if there's a case that they Yes. Yes, I, I agree with that. Okay. But, but um, Crawford's decision itself implies that there may be situations where state law would not allow uh, medical monitoring. For example, he looks at, uh, at the precedent from other jurisdictions where medical monitoring was not allowed and, and determined that it was, it was a different set of facts in those jurisdictions mm -hmm. that, that were not the same as the set of facts here. <coughs> you could, the Vermont Supreme Court could look at that, those precedents and the facts as, as they would apply under those precedents and determine something different. So yes, I would think the Supreme Court would rely on, on the Second Circuit and to uh, maybe a, a smaller extent, federal district court decisions in Vermont and maybe even in New York, but they're not bound by that. Mike, isn't it also true that the courts look to legislatures? Yes. And, um, and so another way to think about it is, do we want to chase a decision that's not yet firm, or a, a direction or a trend, or do we want to help set a trend? Right. I mean, that, that goes to the point that you are the policy makers yeah. uh, at the General Assembly <coughs> for, for state law. Maybe. Um, Maybe I could have Professor Rumbo um, be involved at this point. <laughs> Professor, I for, thank you for being with us. Um, I know you're ill, and uh, I appreciate your taking time by phone. So, well, you're yeah, welcome. Thank, thank you for hope you thank you for me. inviting me to testify. Yeah. Um, I think you've heard where we're at. Uh, I have. Um, I, I would like to address first the issue that, and I'm not sure which senator was speaking, but there were questions about whether Vermont courts or whether federal or state um, or even maybe the Second Circuit would follow the body of case law identified in Judge Crawford's opinion from West Virginia and from Pennsylvania. And <clears throat> there is a risk I think that the Second Circuit can certainly go the other direction. I'm not certain how likely that would be, but if we look to page 15 of Judge Crawford's opinion, he cites another PFO case um, out of the Fourth Circuit, and that's the Rhodes case. And in there, despite the fact that it was applying West Virginia law, in the Bauer case that Judge Crawford relies on, um, it typed very fair, favorably in his opinion. Despite the existence of that case, they denied medical monitoring um, in a PFOA case. And in fact, Judge Crawford writes, let me see if I can find it here, that the Rhodes opinion doesn't accurately describe the state of decisional law in West Virginia. So the, the point I'm trying to make is that there's going to be uncertainty until, um, you know, the issue is finally resolved. Um, first, I think, in the Second Circuit, 
and eventually, you know, in in um, the Vermont Supreme Court, if it were ever to reach there. So what the statute would do is provide the kind of certainty um, about the availability of medical monitoring and the tests um, that would be required to be met in order to obtain the remedy of medical monitoring. Um, it you know, the statute provides that certainty. Yeah. Professor, I'm back. Can I? Um, uh, okay, go ahead, Joe. Professor, I'm Joe Benning. I'm the guy that was asking the question. I'm not suggesting or implying that we not pass in law. I'm right. leaning in the direction after reading Judge Crawford's opinion that we try to design our law to be consistent with what I saw to be perfectly reasonable balance between both sides. And at the end of the day, um, I don't want to end up in a battle over whether we've stepped too far or not, um, but I saw a very reasonably worded opinion that did its best to balance both sides with precedent from West Virginia and Pennsylvania that seem to make a lot of sense to me, and I agree completely that if we have a statute, our Supreme Court is bound um, from all angles, but that to me is really the, the subject of contention, if there is one, as to whether or not we should adopt Crawford's logic in making sure we have a statute that our Supreme Court can look at and be bound by. Okay. Well, let me then turn everyone's attention to the chart I provided to uh, the committee earlier this morning. I'm not sure if everybody has a copy in front of them. It's in that packet. Oh, great. This one? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yep. Okay. This one. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. All right. And I, and I think before I get into that, I do want to um, uh, mention something that... Well, um, I, I do want to mention something. I, I thought Senator Baruch was very accurate. And um, I think it's better for Vermont to have a law that is fair and based on other states. So, it, you know, your comment as well, Senator Benning. The question is, <clears throat> how much do we give to industry um, at the expense of people. And that's where the problem comes in in the, you know, the various sides that have spoken here over the years. And I will remind everybody that S-37 was the result of compromise. It was not something that was done without significant compromise on both sides. And yet when it got to the governor's office, several of those who had worked hard for compromise <coughs> got the governor's ear and he vetoed the bill. So if anybody thinks I'm going back and with all these compromises plus the Beck Amendment, they're crazy because I'm not voting for that. So I just want to make that perfectly clear to everyone in this room and in this building and in the state that um, you know, I, I feel blindsided by the process, quite frankly. It left the Senate with strict liability. The House stripped it out as part of the compromise. And now here we are. <coughs> A year later, three years later, trying to get a bill through. I, it just really is um, tragic to me that you could have people, your own constituents, who don't know that their water is contaminated, that they've been drinking on with for years, and could suffer the same things that people in Bennington are going through. And we don't have a remedy because we. We compromised, but it wasn't good enough compromise. I just, 
I, I agree totally. Um, I wanted to just pick up on something Joe said because I, I hear Joe operating in a in a spirit of compromise in a good way, trying trying to offer. I think that we um, leave S thirty seven to one side and work on a, a new bill that's more in line with the Crawford decision. But to go back to what you said, I think that takes us down the same path with the same uh, forces arrayed against it. Um, and I don't know that we would wind up with anything significantly better or even significantly more in line with the judge's decision, ultimately. So I, you know, I will put my cards on the table early, maybe, but I would prefer that we override with the knowledge that, as you said, we originally had a principle much like the judge lays out where everybody is covered. And we did a series of carve-outs that make no philosophical or moral sense. They make sense in a practical political context. And I, I voted for the bill because I believe on balance it's better. But, uh, you know, that's as far as I can go. Uh, professor, we kind of got off on a tangent there, but thank you for being patient with us. Oh, you're welcome. Um, so the, oh, I wanted to reiterate something that uh, Mr. O'Grady mentioned early in his testimony, in that the exact meets and bounds of the test that Judge Crawford has identified are not fully set in stone yet. So there is still some level of change possible from this particular language. And I raise that issue because um, in determining whether the opinion is meaningfully different from the test that's laid out in S30, S37, there's still some room in the opinion that could change. Right, the, the, the language he uses and how it's applied to the facts of um, the Bennington case can change. But with that in mind, you know, I'd like to turn everybody's attention to the chart I provided. In, in the chart, what I've done is taken the elements from Crawford's opinion, and this is the test uh, that you know, he anticipates applying um, in the Bennington case, and in the next column, I have the relevant provisions from S37. And in, a, in the third column, I address whether or not there's really a meaningful difference between the two. Good. And, and one other thing I, I did want to point out as well is that you know common law, which is what Judge Crawford's opinion and the history of medical monitoring opinions are based in, um, are, more, are, are always based on the facts that are presented to the courts at that time. And so sometimes those cases and the rules that are announced really only apply to the set of facts and the arguments that were brought by the parties to the judge. And in that way, the law can develop over time. And it also means that the language chosen by the judges is often very much um, chosen based on the facts of those particular cases and the arguments. And so statutes are, I think, and, and they are different. They're meant to have more universal application. And so I'd like everybody to keep that in mind as we're going through this. So the first issue, the first element of Crawford's opinion is that he, he would require exposure at a rate significantly greater than the general population. And really the only difference between um, that and S37 is this concept of significance, right? S37 provides that the person, uh, plaintiffs have to prove that the person was exposed to a toxic substance as a result of tortious conduct by the owner or operator um, who released the toxic substance. So there's no, the word significantly, ex, uh, significantly exposed or significantly greater exposure doesn't occur there. 
So that's not a huge difference. It's not a huge difference. And the reason that it's not a huge difference is that the purpose of that significantly greater language stems from the case law where plaintiffs sought to prove exposure to the defendant's toxic chemicals by comparing the plaintiff's exposure to a broader exposure, right? And so there the focus was, well, is this is their exposure greater than what uh, typical background lovers, what other people in the area would be exposed to? And this is the, uh, the Third Circuit case, um, which stems from Pennsylvania law. And in that case, and I've got the quote here, the court there recognized that even if the exposure was within background levels, as long as the exposure was from the defendants and it's significant and it was sufficient to result in their illness, the plaintiffs could um, prevail and receive medical monitoring. So what S37 does is it encompasses the it encompasses significantly greater by tying exposure to the defendant's tortious conduct. And <clears throat> therefore, modifying S37 to include some concept of significant exposure or significantly greater than, you know, exposure significantly greater than the general population really doesn't address the universe um, of proof that could be offered, right? The point is that, as recognized in this Third Circuit decision, the, defend the plaintiffs have been exposed to the defendant's toxic chemicals, and as a result of that exposure, medical monitoring is warranted. So S37 addresses the concern and the issue that is um, implicated in the term significance. <coughs> Does everybody follow that, or are there any yeah. questions? Yep. 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 Okay. Michael, do you have a copy of the governor's veto? It's in our packet. I have right here. Oh, could I have that, please? Well, it's a summary. Yeah. yeah. No, I want to, uh, the governor's actual words. That he used the the that he bill. I don't have it available. I, I believe he talked about insurance and other matters. And I, I would like to have, I wanted to ask questions about that. Go ahead, Professor. I'm sorry for interrupting. I'll hand this out anyway, though. All right. So, the, again, the, just to, hide, to, to try to Website. summarize it, the significant exposure issue mm -hmm. comes from the cases where the plaintiffs tried to um, prove the defendant caused the um, the need for medical monitoring by comparing levels that they were exposed to to some, you know, other background or similar type levels, right? It's not the case where they have more direct evidence of this is defendant's chemical and, and tying it more directly through modeling or, or something of that nature. All right. Professor, I just got to ask um, our counsel here, because I'm looking at the side-by-side -side that he provided to us on this particular question. Michael, do you agree with the professor that there's no meaningful difference between those two elements? I don't. Okay. What is your difference of opinion? I agree that the Pelley rally our case um, made the decision that it did in 94, but there have been uh, decisions in other jurisdictions which have used a significantly greater threshold or element um, to, to bar a case, bar the remedy. Okay. And, and I think what my point is, I, I don't disagree with what um, Mr. O'Grady has said. My point is that the way S37 is written is very much in line with the Crawford opinion and how he's proceeding through the case. And what my fear would be is that if you put the element significant into the 
text of the statute itself, then you bring in those decisions which I think are wrongly decided, right? And you run the risk of making it um, far more difficult uh, to address the same kinds of concerns of exposure that we had in Bennington in future cases. So, like, I think what Mr. O'Grady is saying, and it's absolutely accurate, is that other case law interpreting this term significant, <clears throat> have, people have used, attorneys have used that word significant to try to eliminate the possibility of recovery of medical monitoring. Yep. But at the end of the day, if it's not, if the word significant isn't in the statute, the concerns that the original cases tried to address, and this is Paoli, this is Bauer, those concerns are covered by the statute because you still have to prove it was the defendant's release of a toxic chemical that warrants the need for medical monitoring. And this is consistent with the testimony that you know, I've provided in the past to the committee and other committees. <coughs> Um, thank you. Okay. The, the next two elements of Judge Crawford's opinion, um, to a proven hazardous substance, I don't believe there's any difference meaningfully between that and the test outlined in S37 because as there was considerable testimony about this in prior hearings, uh, Toxic substances, there needs to be some kind of proof that it is going to um, result in an increased risk that warrants medical monitoring. It's not limited to any particular list. So I don't see any meaningful dis uh, difference there. Can I ask again, our counsel, do you agree with that? I think the uh, Ultimately, the significant difference is the exclusion of pesticide application and ammunition and the components thereof from the definition of toxic substance. Um, that is not within the Crawford decision. So under the Crawford decision, it could apply to pesticides applied according to good practices. Um, so it would affect farming. <coughs> <clears throat> Professor, I'm sorry to, to keep interrupting you, but I have two side-by-sides I'm trying to work from and, and make sure I'm understanding the arguments from both angles. All right. Yeah, I'll share. I did not address the exemptions in my chart. No. And that's, that's, I think we, um, there clearly is a huge difference. <clears throat> if I was a small business in Vermont or a farmer, I'd be more concerned with Judge Crawford's decision than I would be with S-37, I would guess. Not that I'm either one of those two things. I do have a small garden that grows well with PFOA. I just can't grow anything underground. Um, the next element, as a result of tortious conduct of the defendant. Thank you. Again, I think that language is in uh, S37, and therefore there's no meaningful distinction between. Okay. The next test, or the next element is, as a proximate result of the exposure, plaintiffs have suffered an increased risk of contracting a serious disease. Um, the word serious does not appear in S37, but as far as whether that's a meaningful difference, um, I don't believe it is. There's only one appellate decision that I've ever identified that defines the term serious in relation to disease. Um, in that, <clears throat> excuse me, and that definition <coughs> includes another wiggly word uh, which, or phrase which is significant impairment. Um, but there the court didn't define the term significant impairment in 
I, it doesn't offer much guidance from there. Ultimately, <clears throat> the concept of whether a person's disease or, or the disease that, uh, the latent disease that may develop as a result of exposure warrants medical monitoring <clears throat> uh, is addressed through expert testimony. And it's not based on whether any, you know, we, there was discussion, I recall, during previous committee hearings, what's a serious disease, right? And I think that the seriousness of the disease comes through in the test for whether, or in the element under uh, S37 on whether expert testimony can prove that testing is reasonably necessary. Defendants can offer their own expert testimony that diagnostic testing isn't reasonably necessary because the disease is not serious enough to warrant it. And so, you know, ultimately the question is, are courts going to allow people to recover for <coughs> de minimis type issues? You know, I'm not going to, I don't know that I can comment on what exactly that's going to be, but for example, a cough. Um, and I think that comes down to, and is addressed appropriately in S37, in the concept of whether or not testing is reasonably necessary. If a disease isn't serious enough to warrant it, or significant enough, whatever word people want to use, it's likely that the court and the juries will find that it is not reasonably necessary. In, in, the, can I, in the Bennington case, um, the state provided the testing of the constituents who had um, and did it frequently. It was still difficult for many people who had moved out of town, for example, kids whose kids were away at college or had moved to a different state and couldn't come back to get testing. But the state made testing available, and it was not cheap. Is there recovery for that in the Crawford decision? For the testing. And is there an S37? The, te the initial testing to determine whether the blood level is significantly greater, whatever term you use, do you understand what I'm asking? Uh, I don't know if that has been requested um, by the plaintiffs in this case, but I Probably think not. It, it's, it's state state right. I, I do think that you could request that as your damage, part of your damages um, in a but situation. I, my question you. goes to who pay who, because the testing, the initial testing to determine whether your blood level is significantly higher uh, is extremely expensive, and that's why the state did it um, in the Bennington, North Bennington case. I'm curious as to whether Crawford uh, or S37 would address who pays for the testing. Uh, Senator Sears, uh, Craw the Crawford's decision is based on the proof and the definition of the class that plaintiffs offered in, in, in that case. And he speaks to this issue throughout the opinion, namely that the plaintiffs have offered evidence of PFOA levels in uh, the class representative's blood. And, you know, that's a key part of his opinion. Uh, there are other cases where uh, that kind of data may not be available or may be too expensive to um, procure. And in those cases, the plaintiffs may try to prove exposure to the defendant's toxic chemicals by other means. And um, so to the, to the question you're asking, does S37 um, provide for that testing? Well, the answer is it doesn't require that kind of testing to bring a claim and to prevail on a claim. It would certainly, I think, strengthen a case. Mm -hmm. um, and also, uh, it, it certainly allows for the costs of future testing and monitoring 
to be borne by the defendants if plaintiffs succeed in their case. Um, Part of the remedy. I guess the additional question would be many cases Again, part of the, and I'm going back to Bennington, North Bennington again, we had a landfill that was a Superfund site, and there's a portion of uh, the contaminated area that um, was in question in terms of the municipal responsibility. Now, the Crawford decision does not exempt the municipalities, am I correct? Correct. And so under um, S-37, they are, exempt. Correct. So that would be an extremely, I don't know if BLCT cares, but I know Bennington cared, because uh, when we were talking about S-37, that was one of the first things that um, many of my local town managers contacted me about, and select board members, was the exemption for municipalities. That, I, that was um, a real concern, because yeah, many of them operated landfills, of course. Every municipality operated a landfill Every? at some point. They were required by state law to. Oh, God. Your memory is so much better than We're back to following state law. Right? Yeah, back to following state law. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, did, I just mentioned that. I wonder, I'm curious about that. Anyway, thank you. Uh, just a brief review of the governor's veto, and I remembered what he had said, but I wondered if either of, if you could comment on this. He said, while we made progress this year in the discussion about medical monitoring, S-37 has passed lacks the clarity needed by Vermont employers <coughs> who our state relies on to provide good jobs. Numerous Vermont employees have expressed concerns to me and to legislators that the unknown legal and financial risks and increased liability is problematic for continued investment in Vermont. If Vermont manufacturers and others cannot secure insurance or cover claims, then our economy will weaken, jobs will be lost, tax revenue will decline, and ultimately all Vermont is loose. Is there any evidence, uh, Professor, in uh, these other states that companies are no longer able to insure, get insurance, like Pennsylvania, West Virginia? Not that I am aware of. And I think Judge Crawford addresses the financial related issues and the economic related issues um, in his opinion um, when he speaks to New Jersey. New Jersey has had the law of medical, has allowed for medical monitoring since I believe 1987. Um, there's a seminal case out of, the, uh, out of that state. And Judge Crawford state, uh, in, in that sense, you know, that's um, state with a lot of heavy industry and, yeah. and, and, and certainly hasn't. Uh, you mean the Garden to, State? The, the Garden State. <laughs> um, it hasn't appeared to suffer any negative consequences from it. Um, and I think the same can be said for Pennsylvania and in other states that have allowed medical monitoring to go forward. Um, Missouri um, and, uh, and all the others. And, and to the, you know, the insurance risks involved, I, I think what Crawford's opinion does too is show that, well, medical monitoring, the possibility of medical monitoring um, liability has existed in the state regardless of um, statute because the common law can evolve and, you can, and parties can bring these kinds of claims when the law isn't necessarily settled and have the, have the court, just like Judge Crawford did, rule that liability exists. So to the extent that there's uncertainty, I, I think that we're in a position now where the status quo is, is, is still some level of uncertainty as to the precise meets and bounds of the test uh, under Judge Crawford's ruling, both because he states as much in his opinion, and also because we're not sure how the Second Circuit might, uh, okay, um, whether it would rule in the same way, uh, in in what the Vermont Supreme might, Court might do if 
asked to answer that question. How will, I, you know, this is the non-lawyer question. How long will it take for appeals to go through in this case to finally get settled if the companies and the plaintiffs don't reach some sort of settlement? Well, I'll, I'll share that there was an appeal to the Second Circuit out of a similar PFOA class action suit in New York. And I know the briefing was completed in that case in, I think, mid-2018. So that's about a year and a half ago, and there still hasn't been a decision there. And, and in this case, you know, there's still a fairly long way to go before, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> there, before trial, um, before there's a decision, um, and before that appeals process uh, would play out. So we, we, we could be talking three to five years? I think that's a fair estimate, yes. So that would be more uncertainty for Vermont businesses. Correct. Joe? Professor and Michael, I'm going to ask both of you. Um, first, as a result of something that Philip said earlier, I don't want there to be any misconception. I'm not suggesting we not pass 30 cents or override the veto. The question I have is, do we adopt in 37 the six-step criteria on page 30 of Judge Crawford's decision in order to try to be consistent <coughs> with other states and where I think the Second Circuit is going? What is the harm in using that six-step criteria in S37? Tell me what the difference would be between how we have set up a list of criteria and the judge's six-part list of criteria. Well, I, I think there are significant differences, um, largely because of policy decisions that you made last year in enacting S-37, beginning with the coverage of S-37. It does not apply to municipalities. It does not apply to farming or application of pesticides in good practice. It does not apply to, to ammunition and the components thereof. <coughs> then the Crawford decision requires that significant exposure greater than the background level. It's not required under S-37. Okay, and that I, was a policy decision that you made last year because that was put in front of this committee and the House committee. And then last, I think the next significant difference is in the cost component uh, of medical testing. Um, and specifically, the Crawford decision says that monitoring procedures exist which are reasonable in cost. Um, and I, I, that is not required under S-37, and I think uh, that would be an issue um, that a defendant's attorney would latch on to as to whether or not a, a testing is too expensive or the universe of plaintiffs is so large that the economic effect of a moderately priced test is, is too burdensome. Um, so that, those are the three key differences, the scope um, and the exemptions, the significance requirement, and the reasonableness of cost. Can I hold both of you for a second? Peggy, could you find what we just, from Senator Benning's question to Mike's answer, can I have actually a hard copy of that from the tape? You know what, I have to admit, I did not hear what you guys said, so you're going to have to tell me. I can, I can find it. I, I'd like, I would like a copy of that, because I, it's, a, it's critical that, and I tried to write it down, to be honest with you, but. So it's 10.05. I'm, I'm confused, though, Joe. You, 
You said you're not saying that we should Shows override, the, the response. but you suggested that we should add something to the bill. I, I don't see how we add anything to the bill. The crux of the conversation is yes. the criteria. No, no, but I, I'm just saying, forgetting the legal issues. I'm not saying we abandon S-37. I'm saying that in order to meet the governor's concerns. No, you're talking about creating a new bill. I'm not. I'm suggesting tweaking the criteria by which decisions are rendered. No, but correct me if I'm wrong, and um, <coughs> Mike, too. Our only choice on S-37 is whether to override the veto. We can't amend we, S-37. Right. So we can do a new committee bill. We can do well, a new bill. That's what I'm saying. He, but in, that in essence, happen. you're talking about I'm not. There's a the whole process. lot of material in S-37 yeah. that I have absolutely no problem with. Whether it's a committee bill to redesign, I'm not trying to leave the impression that things like municipal exemptions, et cetera, are suddenly chucked out the window. That's not where I'm I going am. with this. You want to? I'll chuck it? every exemption out if we go backwards. Yeah, I'm, I'm just clarifying. I'm not going to vote for something that has the exemptions plus. I mean, we might as well do the Beck Amendment and go home and say, what a wonderful thing we did. Uh, you know, we just. I'm not looking at the Beck Amendment. I'm only looking at the six. Well, I mean that, that's, but, but you can't have you can't have it both ways. I'm sorry. You get the exemptions or you don't get the exemptions. my, I'm only one vote here. But for me to vote for something um, that weakens in any way, you know, I'm, I'm happy to do the Crawford bill. I'm happy to do a bill just based upon uh, the Crawford decision. If, uh, what I was but I'm not happy to do a bill based upon the exemptions plus Crawford. I was trying to clarify so I, I, to vote for. I thought Joe inadvertently um, confused the issue a little bit <coughs> as though we could amend S-37 and, and then vote on it. So S-37 is what it is. It is what it is. And personally, I would prefer not to go back through and start a new bill and go through that entire process again. Um, so I, I think the committee is best led to make a, a decision about the override, yes or no. Um, if the override fails, we can always start a new bill. Yeah. If, if I can try to address some of Senator Bennington, or Benning's questions, um, you know, what's... <coughs> What's the, what's the problem with adopting Judge Crawford's S uh, verbatim or adding words like significantly posed or um, adding the word cost into the consideration of medical tests or procedures? And I think that the, the first question really is whether <laughs> whether those words address, you know, whether those words serve a purpose that's not already addressed. Because if those concerns are already dressed, addressed in the statute as written, then there's got to be, then, then you run the risk of these extra words and modifiers um, creating problems for people who are trying to recover under the same set of circumstances. <clears throat> and again, the purpose of the significantly greater exposure <coughs> is to try to ferret out claims where people, where the plaintiffs cannot tie their exposure to the defendant's toxic substances. Right? Mm. If you, you know, one way to prove that is by showing your exposure is greater than background. But if we, if we look to S-37, that problem is already addressed because it requires proof, and it can be the comparison of your exposure to some background level, or it can also be a different kind of proof where you 
proof that the contaminant or the toxin came from the defendant and you were exposed to it more directly. Air modeling, you might, you know, have some other kind of proof. F37 addresses that issue. And so if you add the term significant exposure or greater exposure, and you bring a claim and your offer of proof is, well, I can show you that the defendant is the one who exposed me. Do you also want to force that plaintiff to say that that exposure is significantly greater or more significant than in some other situation? And I think that really confuses the issue. Now, it may not, it, I think it has been an issue in other um, <clears throat> cases that use this language. Mr. O'Grady pointed it out. Now, fortunately, I don't think it's an issue in the Bennington case, but it could be in future cases. And so why create that extra step to get over if it's not relevant to the underlying issue, which is, did the defendant cause the problem? Or, you know, again, it's, you know, the courts are worried about everybody having some claim for medical monitoring just because they've got a level of some chemical in their body, regardless of the source. And so they want to pin it on, they want to make sure that plaintiffs can pin it on the defendant. F37 addresses that issue, and if you add the word significant to it, because it's a statute and the courts have to give meaning to every word, whereas there's more flexibility in common law to address the facts of each case, <clears throat> you run the risk of creating unnecessary and frankly unfair requirements for plaintiffs who can prove the defendant exposed them. So that's the harm, that's the potential harm anyway, of including that term in S37, <coughs> adopting the Crawford <coughs> verbatim in a statute. Professor, I appreciate that, and I don't want to belabor the point, but what I appreciate most is that you addressed directly the question. Um, I'm looking now, you've just addressed criterion one. Um, I'd like to walk through two, three, four, five, and six. Michael identified two other issues. Um, is there anything else that you see in the remainder of those criteria that you believe um, is different from S37 in a way that would be unacceptable? I think there's also uh, the, the question of whether or not a disease is serious. To make that a separate element of the test would... <clears throat> Create, create a problem where someone has to, where, well, let me back up. First of all, there isn't good case law um, defining what is a serious disease is. The only case law out there that has a definition says death or significant impairment. That's not Vermont law, that's not West Virginia law, that's not Pennsylvania law, that's Utah law. So there's not a whole lot of uh, you know, there, there isn't any consistency really across the board there. And the question again is, does this issue of seriousness of the uh, disease somehow get addressed in S37? As my chart shows, I think the answer is very much yes. If a disease isn't serious as whatever, however that's defined, it would, I think, be fairly easy for defendants to offer expert testimony that diagnostic testing for that insignificant or non-serious disease isn't reasonably necessary. So rather than debate whether, you know, uh, whether something is a significant impairment or a serious disease, let's have the judge and the jury, as in S37, determine whether or not testing for that condition or disease is, is reasonably necessary. That will address the same concept as the text of Crawford's opinion lays out. Insignificant problems that the law shouldn't 
you know, allow recovery for, or that juries wouldn't allow recovery for. Professor, I'm a criminal trial attorney by trade, and we have this definition of serious bodily injury when you launch a simple assault uh, case into a felony assault case. And I'm looking at the word serious as Crawford has written it, and in S37, we leap to whether or not diagnostic testing is reasonably necessary. I'm struggling with the concept of how we determine whether something is reasonably necessary. If, for instance, as a result of my exposure, I get a rash, as opposed to as a result of my exposure, I get cancer. Who and how do you reach the determination of whether or not diagnostic testing is reasonably necessary? You, you reach that determination through expert testimony. So for example, if, if the plaintiff put forward a plan for medical monitoring, and the plan for medical monitoring calls for um, <clears throat> uh, periodic testing to determine if a rash is going to develop sometime in the future. There will be conflicting expert testimony from the defendants likely saying there is no need for and it's not reasonably necessary to test for the occurrence of a rash because it's, it's not very significant. It's, it's a rash. People could, you know, <laughs> it is a case-by-case -case basis. You, you do, I don't think what you want to do is set out an element that plaintiffs have to prove a disease is serious. But we don't, we don't have the word significant it will not appear in the first question. If we don't have the word significant in the first question, that literally means to me anyway that it doesn't matter what kind of reaction you have had to the exposure. The question is whether or not you've been exposed and whether testing is reasonably necessary is left in the wind, and, and maybe I'm just completely out of whack here, but in, at least in the criminal perspective, you can get into an argument over whether or not you've had a bruise from somebody punching you, as opposed to whether you've lost an eye, and there's a clear delineation between what is a misdemeanor and what is a felony. And I guess I'm, I'm coming back to, is anybody that has been exposed entitled to testing simply because they've been exposed, the word significant does not appear in that chain of questions. So educate me. How is it that I'm, I'm missing what would normally be a clear signal in the criminal world, but here we're developing something that could enable literally anybody who's been exposed so, to demand a test. So S37, yeah. you're correct, doesn't include a seer for the requirement that the injury be serious or that the exposure be significantly greater than background levels. But as the professor was just referencing, it does require that the testing be reasonably necessary. Reasonably necessary is defined what, what, how you prove reasonably necessary as expert testimony that a physician will prescribe diagnostic testing because the increased risk of contracting the disease due to exposure makes it reasonably under, uh, necessary to undergo diagnostic testing different from what would normally be prescribed in the absence of exposure. So the bruise, if you got a bruise from exposure and the expert testimony is that the physician would not prescribe diagnostic testing in the absence of that exposure, I think that's where you where you build in that that concern. That that's where it would be addressed. Um, do you understand my point? So I talking, hear you what you're saying. Right? We're talking in essence about multiple <coughs> versions of the same thing. So um, in it's a in, different approach. Well, yeah, so, but if you had significant, if you required that um, symptoms be present 
um, if you require this test that currently exists in S37, there are, it would be three different ways of getting to the same thing. S37 has a um, and but it's there, and it's uh, it will be activated in any proceeding. And there, there will be there will be dispute in the litigation between expert testimony about whether or not a physician would prescribe this in the um, from what in the absence of what would normally be prescribed. And I, I that, but you heard testimony last year that that the litigation is going to require a lot of discovery, a lot of dispute. There's going to be um, many expert testimony, expert te experts providing testimony. Um, I think this is this is an example of that, um, but I do think it addresses the significance and serious component. I'm going to. Uh, are there any other, are there other questions for Professor Rumble and Michael on this bill at, at this point? Because I do want to leave a little time for the committee to discuss. And hopefully, Professor, if you could stay on the line for a few more minutes, and Mike, could, where do we go from here? I, I, I think the, the Senate is looking to us for what to do. I'll tell you where I am. You are. I, I think that um, listening to all of the differences here and just, I don't want to start over because I think that the compromises we made last year are, as Philip said, I, to quote your eloquence, I think you said, as much as you could swallow, <laughs> that, um, something like that. Um, but um, so I'm, I'm ready to, to, try for an override, and if that fails, then we can start over again. But I don't want to start over now, especially since my questions have been answered about the differences. I, I just keep coming back to this quote from the decision. The choice between permitting and excluding a medical monitoring remedy for potential future illness is a choice between competing values. And he doesn't, uh, or the judge doesn't seem to be preferring one of those sets of values, to me that sounds like a nod to a legislature. Mm -hmm. Provide us with guidance on your values as a state. And the conversation we had today mirrored the one we had in creating the bill. So Joe was a great advocate for um, a more economic development focused perspective. He was very vocal about protecting the mom and pops which we did with the, uh, with the mm -hmm. 10, well, right. Mm -hmm. um, so I think S37 produced a compromise that, that I would describe as the best we were gonna get, and I think that's the kind of thing this committee was designed to do. Um, so I would be for going forward with it and, and not for no reason, because we do have the veto override option, going down the path of writing a new bill. I appreciate the fact that we had a discussion over Judge Crawford's decision. Frankly, I don't think we needed to have that conversation if the intent was simply to focus on the governor's message and vote to override or not. Since Judge Crawford issued the decision, I personally saw somebody working through the same process but using legal precedent in other jurisdictions, which made a hell of a lot of sense to me and still does. And as a result, I don't think I'm going to change my vision on what the posture of the case is, but it's obvious that, that we're not going to come up with a committee bill that's different. Um, so I'm right back to where I was in the beginning. I share the concerns of any prospective plaintiff who would be in a bad situation. What I'm concerned about is we are not leaving as clear guidance as what I saw in Judge Crawford's decision um, to those who would be able to make a credible argument versus those who
who might want to take advantage for whatever reason, and that is where I'm left with concern. You know, if you're thinking about what would, you know, we paid for the testing before, mm -hmm. what's your thought on we would, the state would pay for the testing of these people who are at risk, and then we're, of course, in a suit to get money from St. Gobain if, if it should be a winnable suit. It sounds like it probably would be. No, that would be a no, way to we have, we, we, we reached an agreement with this, we, we the state reached an agreement with State Cobain, I believe, <coughs> that they would pay for the installation of drinking water, uh, uh, town and village drinking water, mm -hmm. to the people of Bennington and North Bennington, and that was, uh, we gave up our, I believe we gave up the, the ability to sue on, on the uh, cost of the testing. I, I'm not sure on that. We can check with the Attorney General, but I, I believe we reached, we, the state of Vermont, reached agreement with St. Cobain on those things, leaving the issues of strict liability, people's uh, ability to, to get money for the loss of home value, get money for the interest to go to a town water line paying for water that they weren't paying for before, the town village water. Um, and other things that were costly to them, that's the strict liability portion. We left that to the court. So we, the state, made that agreement, I believe. So. But we could check with the AG. Oh. I mean, we're not, the state isn't out on We also right. agreed to do some things. You remember in the appropriations bill, we agreed to do some things in one corner of Bennington where it was dispute. About the, use some fund. So I mean, how many how many persons are there that are in this position of needing the monitor? Do we know? Have any idea? I think there's around 450. Well, we're we're talking about a they expected right. You'll need yeah. to unlock your iPhone first. So oh, thank you. I pushed a button to try to put it down, and I pushed the button, and, to, and so that was Siri telling me to unlock my iPhone before I do anything more. So we're we're not, as I see it, we're not talking at all exclusively about the problem. Right. Actually, S thirty seven is not doesn't, retroactive, so it right. doesn't impact whatever the the outcome is in Bennington, North right. Bennington. Well, you know, I I guess. Let me be clear about something. I generally have supported Bill Scott, you know, and a lot of the things that he's done. We work closely together in this committee on a number of issues. I just don't agree with his two vetoes this year. I think they were short-sighted. And I, had he not vetoed the firearm bill, and I don't know where that'll go, um, I think we would have, you know, not be having this discussion this year about firearms, yeah. frankly. Um, and secondly, on this bill, I think he was short-sighted in, in his veto that, um, and I understand what he, what he was doing, and I don't, you know, I, I respect his position. I just don't agree with it, and I think it's, that it's up to us to try to override it, and if, if we can't, then maybe we wait for a new governor. Because I'm not sure the results, I'm not sure that we can compromise any more than we already have to get to where he wants to be, which is the Beck Amendment. And then we would spend a lot of time. Huh? I don't know that it's totally the Beck Amendment. Well, that's what he said in his veto message. Is that what they told you today? No. So that's what he says. You know, I don't mind what he said back then. What are they saying today? When well, I mean, his veto message is today. I mean, it's. No, when Jay and Kendall came in, are they suggesting anything? No, no, no. That, that discussion would have nothing to do with S-37 okay. or, or the firearm bill. Our, our discussion this morning was about the criminal justice reform. <laughs> The, the insanity plea, the criminal justice reforms, the bail property, bail and uh, justice reinvestment too. So, that. so what do they tell you about 
is there a way for, I mean, I thought they, that the governor actually would like to get to medical monitoring if there could be some things in place. Well, what I, are those I don't know. Then. I've never had that conversation. I had a I brief had conversation. A I, I'm just going by the veto message. It says the good news is there's a pass forward, the bipartisan amendment introduced by Representative Beck, etc. That's why I kept referring to the Beck amendment. So this is all, Joe, what, what do you know I that have, I don't know? I have personally never read the Beck Amendment. What I do know is that the governor's office could live with the Crawford decisions criteria. And that is, since this was on the agenda, that's why I've been having my part in this conversation. I do not want to come out of this committee looking like I am screwing people who are in legitimate need of having mm -hmm medical monitor. I am coming out of this wanting to believe that I have looked at a decision that looks perfectly reasonable in a balancing test that has other state connections to the conversation and it, in my brain says our Supreme Court, if we hand them a statute that is consistent with those legal opinions elsewhere and the balancing test that Crawford set out made a hell of a lot of sense to me. And I don't, you know, I got quoted on the radio yesterday as saying I'm batting foul balls or whatever the case may be. That's where I'm at with this. I, mean, I don't want to come out of here sounding like I am opposed to people getting what they deserve. I'm uncomfortable with the delivery of what we're handing the courts because it is not 100% consistent with what other states have done. And that always makes me a little bit nervous especially when our own Second Circuit has given us an idea of what the facts are in the case before it, and suggesting, I think strongly, how we should be coming up with a conclusion. But I, I agree with what Dick said earlier. I, I think what the governor would want, ultimately, is the tests from the Crawford decision and the carve-outs from S-37. And I, I think he would refuse to sign the bill without those carve-outs. Mm -hmm. And the whole, the whole point was that we did our own balancing tests in here, long, detailed process with lots of advocacy from lots of special interests, and we wound up where we wound up. The judge starts from a place of allowing a much, much, much larger universe of, of persons, and then he has the more specific tests. So. I don't think if you gave the governor the Crawford decision, I don't think he would sign that. I, don't think so um, I think he's more likely to sign S-37. Obviously, he, he vetoed it, and we're going to try to override. But I, but I think ultimately, if he was given both, Dick was making this point indirectly, because it, it carves out municipalities, mm -hmm. because it carves out small business um, exceptions for lead. Um, pesticides, etc. I, I think, you know, the override is something I wouldn't admit it in public, but I think it's something we maybe prefer to the pure Crawford decision. I am not the governor's spokesperson. Yeah. yeah I, know, I have. We know that. None of us suggested that, Joe. We know that, that actually. <laughs> but but <laughs> when you leap to the conclusion that he would not sign something, the information that I have that if the Crawford criteria were adopted, he would be comfortable enough with the bill to sign it. That's the information that I have. <coughs> I hear directly from the administration. They're their own uh, can, can Michael, uh, Michael O'Grady has to leave. Okay. Do you have a question? I, I have. For Professor? No, I want to excuse no. the professor and Mike. Yes. Professor, you, you've been so Thank helpful. You. Thank you so much. And I'm. Uh, hopefully you feel better, and hopefully we didn't inter interfere with your recuperation. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now. So my question was, when you say he would sign the Crawford decision, you, you Crawford criteria. Crawford it's criteria, criteria in addition the to the carve outs and the stuff that we already have if, given. If that, I'm, I'm assuming the yeah. remainder of S37 remains intact. 
he would prefer to have those six, those steps. six steps. But some of and those six steps are different than the steps we currently have in the S thirty seven. Another way to say it is that he might sign a significantly weaker bill. And well, I, I think it's already as weak as it can get and still be an effective redress for what people are, you know, potentially suffering. But didn't we hear that some of them aren't even significant differences, like the serious disease, the right. significant, um, the the coverage? He he didn't have carve outs in there, though, so that's one of his steps. And that so if we put that in there as one of the steps to look at, then that exempts the carve outs. Then I mean that gets rid of them, and the cost of medic the cost component of medical monitoring that seems to me that that's the only significant difference in the six steps and our, and our bill. That, that's what I got from Michael. I understood there were four differences. I don't want to belabor this point because I feel like we're just we're really right. circle. The word significant. Right. The word serious. Yes. For disease. Whether medical monitoring procedures exist was an issue, and whether or not those that exist are reasonable in the cost. <coughs> those are the differences, and I will concede yeah. that in the current state of S37, that tweaks it in a direction that is different than what this committee had originally concluded. Well, I guess I'll leave yeah, it at I, that. And, and yeah. Get back to the same question. Do we want to have the governor's decision overridden or not. It is obvious we are not moving in the direction of changing this by way of the committee bill. I think the problem is that, you know, I, the six tests that you point out, as I understand it, the one problem there, one of the major problem there is, is as a proximate result of the exposure, plaintiffs have suffered an increased risk of contracting a serious disease. What's a serious disease? And then finally, monitoring procedures exist which are reasonable in cost and safe for use. Um, I, I'm not sure, you know, if I, if I had drank the water in my neighborhood down the, down the hill where they didn't have village water, I'd be in that heightened place. And quite frankly, I wouldn't give a damn about the cost to St. Gobain. I'd want to know whether I've got I've got a good chance of having cancer. And I want to get that early. I don't want to have to wait <coughs> until I'm, you know, have to have a body organ removed or I'm dead or my kid is dead because they drank the, the water. And it's it's really um, and I, I just worry about putting roadblocks <coughs> in places that would arm people. <laughs> I, I, and I'm sorry to be so, I mean, this is like mom and apple pie to me. I, I, you know, I, I have friends who are living this. Um, and they're worried. And frankly, um, you know a few of them. And they're worried. They're, I think they're more worried about their family members than themselves in large part. You know. Now I had dogs at a kennel that drank the water and both dogs ended up with cancer. Do I know that was a result of their of their drinking the water from that was contaminated in those wells? I don't know. But it's interesting that they were both young, relatively young when they died of cancer. And so I've kept my new dog away from that kennel <clears throat> and also um, you know don't let him try at my best to not let him dig in the yard and eat the grass and stuff <laughs> yeah, yeah I don't know yeah, when you live in the in the zone you look at this thing a lot differently believe me I think Michael did a good job of answering the issue of the serious disease or not when he read that section from the bill that talked about if, if 
if somebody would do the testing, if they wouldn't do the testing if it wasn't for the exposure, then it's serious enough to require the exposure. I think he did a really good job of answering that, and, and it's in the bill. And the whether it's reasonable in cost and safe to administer, that as I understand it, that's something that will be decided in a court. It doesn't guarantee that it's there, but somebody you're going to have an expert saying, yes, it is reasonable, and it, it's costly, and it's safe, and you're going to have another expert saying it's not, and it's going to have to be for the courts to decide. I, 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 that, that is the one thing that I think that is, um, that is different and that it's going to be he said, she said, and my expert is better than yours. I so. agree, and I, I think um, I'm, I'm going to just go. I really respect you. I'm, that's not a disrespectful. Oh. I understand where you're coming from. Also, want to give the governor's due. I mean, I, you know, you read his veto message. All the things that Governor Scott's administration and Governor Summons' administration did to respond to this. And I compare that with the Cuomo administration's response in nearby Hoosier Falls and other areas in New York State that had a similar problem. And it's like night and day. And I and you know, I one of the first questions people from Albany, New York media asked me is why is Vermont so different in its response? I said, because our governors and our administration two administrations in a row, both committed mm -hmm. to helping our constituents deal with this problem. And, you know, Phil has been absolutely wonderful on this, as was Peter Shumlin. I don't mean this to be critical of Phil Scott, but his veto is, to me, was wrong on both bills. So, I, I just have one last I'm thing to I, say. Uh, I just have one last thing to say. I don't think that anybody who actually knows you <coughs> would think that you were out to deny people what they needed in order to be well. I, I think that that's, um, I mean, anything can be said in the press and anything can be rumored and it's just because of our superior attitudes that, that um, and, and I love yeah. Joe as much as the next guy. But what I would say is, we wondered about this. Can I, can I, can I call a question? At some point? <laughs> what I would say is, it goes back to the idea of, of values. So, are people who need it going to get monitoring or not? And so far, we've gone years right. without it. We heard that even with S thirty seven, we we might wind up with yep. years of. Uh, so, you know, I, I think at a certain point, everybody has to. Um, we examine their values, and, and I don't think it's unfair for people to be criticized for no. a decision that they make based on the, their values that leads to somebody right. not getting medical testing. I, as chair of this yep. committee, I will now call the question, and the vote is three, one, maybe. But the question is what, specifically? To override. No. Three, two. Well, we'll see so, what college wanted to do. Yep. Okay. Nobody else voted. Huh? Nobody else voted. Well, I think so. it's pretty Oh, I, vote, I already said you my statement. You said yes, right? Oh, oh I didn't call. say yes. Are calling the roll on that? Okay. Are you going to call I wasn't, the roll? I wasn't going to, but if you want I mean, is the whole thing on me? That seems to be what you are in. No, I'm, I'm no. a no vote. I, and by the way, we all want to get to the same place for the people who are affected. And I we have a could. difference of opinion as to how we get there, I, and I that's think we the could subject. get there. <clears throat> well, we could if we the could veto fails, we can start only over again. We, only if we compromise more. You and know, if I didn't vote for the bill initially, because, I know you did because it doesn't. In one another thing, I really didn't like. Uh, what is it? Fifth? Are we at ten or more people? If you have ten or more employees, which yes. is uh, ten. When you build your own house, you have 10 employees. Your oil tank leaks under the neighbor's yard and in their garden, you're yeah. under it. Under the Crawford decision. Uh, that you, everybody if, if if that, that's but, right. But everybody what you, what I think what people are missing is if the Crawford decision becomes the law of the land. Everybody will be under it. 
everybody will be under it, yes. and then your exemptions are gone. I agree. Yeah. That's tough. So that's the deal. Yeah. yeah. I didn't say I like Crawford. <laughs> <laughs> I know you didn't, but you, but you and many other people seem to want the best of both worlds. Both Crawford and well, I don't like neighbors who are neighbors. Well, when you build your own house, they can now. Yeah, they can. See where they get. Well, that neighbor going after a neighbor over cutting a tree down, and that was criminal. And the, the other th thing that I feel like maybe we were too close to it to pull back, we're, we're not talking about medical treatment. No. We're talking, we're talking about, about medical monitoring. 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 Right. We're just talking about monitoring, monitoring. occasionally to see if somebody has well, a disease as compared right. to the universe of liability <coughs> for treatment. Right. Yep. So, um, yes. yeah. yeah. Yeah, but everybody says point. medical yeah. monitoring is so expensive. If it's if it's that expensive, then where's this all going? But if we, if we could choose, if we knew the number of people and we could pay for it in budget, we could pay for the other stuff. Why don't we try it? Well, some of it is expensive and some of it isn't. When we passed it. We passed a um, burn pit bill last year that right. required monitoring for. I mean, that would essentially ask for monitoring for people who had been exposed to burn pits. Well, um, I, I, I want to so. take a break because we have uh, other people at 11, and I have to leave because your MAT and your um, health care contract are both up in approach this year. I figure we can leave it for that. Is that fair? Okay. Mm -hmm. So one, all of you are separately. Yeah. Um, so this is kind of getting ahead of justice reinvestment for port yeah. um, and trying to understand what we can do better. I, you know, I've noticed the same thing. Some of the, um, like for example, um, in some counties there's pathways. In some counties there's uh, pathways as a housing. <clears throat> I don't know if you have it in Windsor County or not. But it's in six counties and not in 12. And we just left off, we're not gonna discuss the healthcare contract if that's why you're here, Andrew. No, I'm just just listen. And the other area that we're not going to discuss is the out-of-state contract, because that's in approach as well with the increase in the appropriation and the budget adjustment. And I'm sure it'll come up. Um, so just kind of an overview of what what problems you're running into in the community <coughs> getting services for people. So obviously we were really involved um, with CSG throughout the time that they were doing all of this data gathering and conversation leading. Um, and I did express to them my concerns about some of the ways um, they were expressing the findings and tried to drill down with them on where the findings were coming from, who they were coming from. Because to be perfectly honest, Senator Sears, I was a little mystified by some of the findings. And I did make that known to them. Um, in terms of care coordination, we have a, a very explicit, and I'm happy to share the process with you. Um, we have a document that we've developed for the Centurion. Um, the process of discharge is very detailed and very um, specific that all of the information that's provided to an inmate about their future health care and care coordination, which obviously is all voluntary um, at the point of release, is provided to them in writing, and they actually <coughs> sign for it. Um, that information is also provided to the case manager, the case worker inside the facility, and then also the probation officer, and it's uploaded into well, the offender management I think system. a lot of our information actually came from probation officers who are frustrated mm -hmm. in getting services from their clients. So I can speak about that as well. I mean, I, you, you said you were mystified by it, but I think that they, I mean, I, I believe that they had conversations with a lot of probation officers around the state, and a lot of this information about care coordination with private providers who are contracting is coming from them. So CSG, when I questioned them about this, said something different to me. They said that um, they had had listening circles with the hubs and the spokes, yes, and that, that had true. come from yep. them, and they never mentioned to me that it came from probation officers, so that is new information for okay. me. Okay, well, some of it did. Yeah. 
So um, they may have had conversations with probation officers after they handled it. Mm -hmm. I know they went around. I got. I think they called them focus groups or whatever yeah. they call them. Yeah. So that's that's outside of my knowledge at this point. So we can certainly go back and, and lead back to that. Well, I, it may have been a different individual having conversations. I think David Demora had conversations with probation officers about their frustration. Because as far as I'm able to ascertain, all of the inmates are, especially in regard to MAT, are connected either to a hub or back to their spoke. And then they're also provided bridge prescriptions, um, which is, again, their choice. The pharmacy of their choice is called and given the requisite number of days of doses, as well as a last dose letter, so that that is you know, adequately covered um, to meet their needs. I think it's housing, jobs, mm -hmm. um, counseling, and then here. I, the report isn't finished yet, so I'm trying to get ahead of the report. Yeah. Um, but I do have some context. I'm not sure the degree to which um, David is reflecting this in, in the report. But uh, one of the things that I would point out is that when he was interviewing, when they were interviewing DOC probation officers, they're talking about not just reentry, but also people who are already in the community and are right. referred from the court, and that there was a, that there was a preponderance of um, moderate high-risk individuals, as you well know, and that officers did find that they were having difficulty. It's not so much in terms of the reentry coordination, as much as having uh, really, you know, <coughs> getting services for people who are already in the community and who they believe need a higher level of care than what they're able to access. So I do know a couple of anecdotal reports, um, just to debrief with right. David. Yeah, I think that part, a major okay. part of it is the coordination of people that like accessing a local mental health center, people accessing a Recovery housing, for example, mm -hmm. people accessing <clears throat> housing, um, reentry people trying to, in some, you know, it, uh, in some areas of the state, there is more availability of services um, than in other areas. And, uh, but anyway, go ahead. I so I know that that was a piece of what he, yeah. what David and. Um, Ellen report yeah. were debriefing when I was in Burlington. I wasn't at Newport and I wasn't at Rutland, but I know that was part of what they uh, represented in, in their debrief when I was there. Um, I think also specifically around some of the contractual relationships that we, that I manage, um, some of what they uh, indicated were, um, again, feeling that we, we are working with a higher risk higher need population and that our actual capacity is limited, that that some of these individuals have, should have access to a more I'm intensive. Don't say something that could easily get misconstrued so you don't understand it. I think we have programs, particularly in communities, that are designed for people that are no longer in corrections, yes. that many of them have been um, dealt with in the diversion or somewhere else, and these programs are trying to be all things to all people and not being very successful at it. And I, you know, a typical example would be a, a housing program where um, somebody slips up and they throw them out. Mm -hmm. But they're much higher risk than what they intended what they expected, I should say. Um, and so uh, I think that's part of the problem. And, and we, we as legislators, many of those programs are based in our communities, and we hear from them about a wonderful job they're doing, but why don't they have more people? And maybe they don't have more people because you don't have those people anymore. I think you're exactly right, Senator, and I think that that's part of what David was representing in terms of the um, 
but many of our partners are, are their models are really more accustomed to dealing with a lower risk. Yeah, I'm gonna get in trouble model. here, but um, I noted that Dismas House is having a big day here in the State House. And I'm not gonna pass judgment on them, but I'm curious as to why all of a sudden they're here in the State House to have a major day. And it, you know, I would just guess that it's part of this problem. And so, are they having trouble getting residents? Yeah, they are. I suspect they are. Yeah. I think they're having some difficulty with referrals. Yes. Well, they're they have very strict guidelines. Mm -hmm. So, one of the constituents that I work was working with mm -hmm. uh, his mother, actually, not him. Yeah. He wouldn't dare call me. Um, <laughs> but you know he. He goes off the porch, visits somebody in a vehicle, says it was his girlfriend. Who knows? Maybe it was a drug deal. Who knows what it was? Gets thrown out. So where does he go? Back to jail. Um, that wasn't anybody's expectation, but you know. So mom's wondering why, you know, why did my good son get thrown out for getting going off the porch? My always good son. Well, you know, moms are there. No I know it's just it's the same as Comcast gets stuck in a ditch. <laughs> That's right. Which is why I have to leave the quarter at twelve. But it, yeah. so, how do we deal with this? What are we going? You know, um, you know, I got my own issues down at two hundred eight depot. They're full now, I guess. They're handling, but they were down to like five people at one point, five or ten, five or six people. So how do we have the community-based organizations um, be prepared for the people that we're sending out or the people that are now on probation that need services, etc.? That's, I think, the, the crux of our discussion today. I think the only thing that I... I mean, my recent experience in terms of doing some work with DOL and participating in the um, RDC's meetings, the Regional Workforce Development meetings, is um, and some of the work on the Adult Reentry and Employment Grant, <coughs> grant is some of our partners are realizing that although criminal justice populations are identified as a special population, they're beginning to realize that the they're identified as a special population because there are very distinct barriers for this population that are not necessarily incorporated into their models. Mm. And, um, and, and so I think that that's an example where we're trying to do a lot of collaboration and, and ed mutual education around this works very well for this subset of the population that we supervise, but for this subset, we're going to need more um, more resources to address different barriers than maybe you're accustomed to, to doing. Well, you know, one of the, one of the things to justice reinvestment will do is reinvest. Mm -hmm. And what is it we're going to reinvest in is critical. And that's where the three of you really come in. Mm -hmm. My opinion is you're, you're the, you didn't, you know, Presumably, we will lower the number of people out of state. I mean, are you going to make a deal with St. Johnsbury to send people that don't need to be there there to fill 50 beds, or are you going to make it? Are you, you know, what are we going to do, for example? I think that's a decision discussion that occurs higher than that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but where are how many contracts do we have right now? Across DOC, there's approximately 60. How many? About approximately 60 across the 60 uh, in the community. Oh, in, just in the community. Yeah. Um, Not the ones in, in the facilities. Um, I'd have to. I apologize it's, for being late. What do you mean, what contracts? And what like subsets? Contracts with um, Dismas House, contracts with oh. local mental health agencies, okay, got contracts it. with yeah. okay. local providers okay. of services. That's all I needed, um, yeah. That sort of thing. Yeah. 
rather than um, yeah. one of the things in the justice reinvestment uh, findings is that many of the contractors, many of the services that are out there are not appropriate for many of the people that Corrections is dealing with in the community. Whether they be on reentry or whether they be on probation or parole. <clears throat> and we, as legislators, frequently hear from these people who contract and say, you know, we want more, you know, we're not, you know, corrections isn't working well with us or whatever. So I, I fully more appreciate um, the information that you're seeking. And so I just would like to restate that I agree with Kim that I think that as we have done our work in corrections, we are really only working with the most moderate to severe individuals. And when they're released, the community is not poised adequately to address their needs. And I think that aside from, and we've been talking about this for a very long time, prior, you know, long, 10 years, that there needs to be a much more intensive training about criminogenic risk and need with Tom H, with Dale, with our agency partners to fully appreciate the needs of this population and program accordingly. What, what is, um, I'm gonna know, specifically the women's population, aren't, aren't there a number of women who are incarcerated that are relatively low risk? Monica is better yeah. positioned to. Oh, there oh, there's two. <laughs> Old numbers the, lady back the, here. If community <laughs> programs were able to step up to handle that population. I don't think, I will look at the slide. I don't think the JR uh, slide on risk actually sh showed that about the incarcerated women, but I need to just look at I thought, it was, I thought the numbers on moderate to low risk were high for women. I'm, I'm going to look at my... Look at the slide. Okay. I thought it was in the 40% range. But then just for clarification, uh, the department doesn't have contracts with DMH or with Dale specifically. Um, the agreement really is to work with these individuals because they're all citizens, and so we don't have special agreements. Um, the only thing that, that well, I'm aware of is Act 78. Um, which was passed several years ago that really uh, strengthened our coordination with DMH already, and it was specifically around people with serious mental illness, the SFI population, charged us with developing um, a mental health unit, as you remember, and that collaboration and coordination happens on a daily basis. We're in constant contact with DMH and also with Dale. I'm less involved with the coordination with Dale because that happens mostly with our director of nursing who unfortunately was not able to attend um, to provide information in today's testimony. Um, but there's constant work on getting people released who qualify for choices for care, nursing home, level of care, et cetera, and she handles that. But we work with DMH on a regular basis and we've met with their new adult uh, chief of psychiatry and they've also extended consultation hours to us um, on an as-needed basis. What about coordination with those folks in the homes? I mean, that happens also through the health department. Every two weeks we have a MAP work group meeting where the health department is present. Dr. Levine and the deputy have also attended at different times. And so that was also where my mystification came in because there's a regular hub meeting that I also sometimes attend. <coughs> Tony Folland um, manages that meeting. And again, the coordination has been really tight. There have been anecdotal situations, but there haven't been systemic failures bet between all the parties to coordinate the care. So we're in a constant state of quality improvement, but so far it seems to be working and people are not being dropped. And when I did ask CSG, because I know that some of that language is in, was in there, I said, well, where are you hearing this? I shared that with Tony. I shared the whole report that's in development at the MAT work group. And Tony also was somewhat confused and scratching his head because he's in constant contact with the hub directors. And he said that he hadn't been hearing any concerns either. 
and that they have the capacity to treat the patients. Um, I know that there's been a hiccup at the uh, at, at BART. They have, were struck with a system-wide national uh, computer virus <coughs> that brought them down Where? From, um, at the BART clinics. What's, what's the BART clinic? Um, the methadone help. The methadone. Mm -hmm. Oh, and we don't have that. Yeah, I know. Where is that? <laughs> and that was well, it was nationwide, um, but there are two oh. clinics: one in Newport and and one in. So a malware? Yeah. Right. yeah. And then at Newport specifically, um, Dr. Nanko, who had, who has been our medical director, was also still filling in as their medical director. He had resigned back in June. He officially stepped down permanently on November 30th. They were able to hire a new doctor. And so there's also been some ramping up time for her to get to speed. Um, and when he was serving in both of those roles, we had a very monitored protocol to ensure that there was no conflict of interest on his determination that somebody may need a health assessment for methadone, because we are not an OTP to be able to do that. And then his work uh, reviewing the assessment uh, to refer to a hub was reviewed by two <coughs> independent doctors across the state, Dr. Brooklyn and Dr. McComas, and also by our medical director, Dr. Fisher. And then the person would be referred to a hub for the assessment. Um, but that all has come around because he's no longer involved with that hub. But those are the things that I'm aware of. Um, there are many, many nuances in, in moving somebody who's on methadone, whether it's to a court case, just changing facilities, verifying that they have enough doses to be sent with them so that they don't need to have a new guest dosing arrangement at another hub wherever they're going to court. If they have enough doses, the doses just travel with them, they're brought back. If that's not going to be sufficient, then we have to follow up doing all the best dosing paperwork that are all DEA regulations that then the health department then has to review to make mm -hmm. happen. But we have a massive coordination and communication <coughs> structure where we track all of that, map all of that, and we can get in it right here and we debate <coughs> doses intact. I, I do think, I'm reflecting on your question, um, Senator, um, I do think that one of the, maybe one of the underlying um, challenges is that um, most of our partners are really operating where uh, the, the treatment focus is client-centered, so it means the client chooses. They can choose to participate or not participate um, at any level. And um, for our officers, when they're supervising in the community, there are things that they're observing that in terms of reducing the risk, it may not be a clinical risk, but it's correlated to their risk of reoffending. And so the officers are asking for assistance from treatment providers who have a different uh, mental model and operational model than than the criminal justice has, uh, system has, or we have in terms of. And so th I think there are times when there is a, um, a mismatch, if you will, in, in terms of the individual may not want to participate, um, may not see themselves as having a particular issue um, with substances mm -hmm. or in addressing their, their mental health issues, may not want to go into a more intensive level of care, may not want to be on medication, and and yet, um, or may not want to address some basic skill deficits that they have in, in education um, or work, and yet officers are finding you can't, you can't progress if you don't address these things. And, and yet our partners are in a position where if they don't want to participate, they're not going to, right. you know, be trying to engage them. Yeah, I uh, I think that's sort of a mis well, we, matching models, if you will. Yeah, I've, I've watched programs evolve, uh, particularly on the juvenile side, you know, like 204 and 206 Depot evolved into more short term what the state needed mm -hmm. and are dealing with some really difficult kids. But I haven't seen the same evolving from other agencies. Um, it seems like there, you know, I need to look at what is the, you know, and I don't know how to get there. And, and that's going to be a challenge going, moving forward. 
even if there's more money available, who's going to deal with these folks? Yeah, I mean, I agree with what Jim's saying. It's really a philosophical paradigm shift. Yeah. And it's really the failure, and I, I mean, you know I'm a counselor and chemist too, but it's a failure to understand the criminal aspect of individuals' ego structure, that there is that as well as mental health and substance yeah, When Senator Benning's not here, the easiest one to talk about is the, is the work camp that's operated by the department. And St. John's very saying, no, we don't want those people that you want to put there, those other 50 beds. But we want those people that can go out in the community and go to work. They're all, they're all gone. <laughs> they're all gone. They're, they're, they're already, already gone. There's, there's no <laughs> way. There's, they're not with us anymore because we've made such a shift. No, I, I yeah. understand that. We agree with you. I, I understand yeah, that, but that's anymore. the dilemma. I know. So, the, so it's, you know, they're saying, well, you know. Fill those 50 beds so we can move people out of corrections into, you know, into the into those 50 beds, but the people don't exist. You are, you you look at the population. Um, by and large, those that are incarcerated are high-risk individuals, which is what it should be. Would St. Johnsbury like women better than men? I don't know if that if. You could ask. <clears throat> well, speaking of contracts, we should probably That's look right. at the St. Johnsbury contract. Mm -hmm. Well, because I believe we're paying them looking. money to. Chittenden has to go away. There is a annual payment made. I mean, Chittenden. Yeah. 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 Putting on our oh, appropriation yeah. tax for Senator Nitker and I, we would like to see a copy of the contract with St. Albans and how it involves the work camp itself, and if the work camp is down to 50 people. St. Johnsbury. St. Johnsbury, what did I say? Albany. 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 You know that. <laughs> there are too many saints in Vermont. That's yeah, the problem. That's the problem. <laughs> well, I still don't even know. I mean, I, I, mean, I had a constituent complain to me, and I, he was right. Way too many. He had to drive to Newport to pick up his son who was being released because you can't get released from Newport if you're not from Newport without somebody taking you out of town. Talk about I think the same thing is true in Springfield, but I'm not sure. I think that that was the deal that they struck with Springfield, too. Well, or that the, may they, be. I don't, I don't know. I mean, that's a little ridiculous, yeah. but on the other hand, you know, it's not <laughs> worth having a big battle over right. but. I think it is worth having a real discussion about those 50 beds. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Given that Senator Benning's chair of institutions, Senator Kitchell's chair of yeah. appropriations, yeah. they may not want to discuss it, but. But we do. Maybe they'd anyway. like 18 to 25 year olds. Okay. Anyway, I think I'm sorry. we're completely in support of having a much closer examination of the practices, policies. Well, that's of what the I was partners. hoping to yeah. begin the discussion of today. That was the real reason to have uh, you here, okay. was not okay. to berate you over your contracts. <laughs> However, yeah. still, still upsets me. I wasn't going to speak about inside, but it still upsets me that people that are getting MAT inside are not required to do at least attend a counseling session. Whether they participate or not is up to them, but bugs me. I know it does. <laughs> <laughs> and why is that? that they're because not it's required? based on medical necessity and it's not programming like program services I see. is where they're forced to attend. I see. But if you, if you, if you, yeah. Yeah, but if you if you need it, you obviously have a problem. And if you have a problem, at least you could attend the meeting. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to do anything. Just go. If you want the drug, so you'd probably have a suit about it if you did that. I don't care. I w I would say everything we've heard is that it's it's now much more expensive a program than we originally thought. Yeah. If we added the the mandatory counseling aspect, of it. <coughs> probably be cheaper. Well, I was going to say it'd probably be a lot more expensive than. than oh, well. Because you have to pay for the counselors. Right. Well, they're supposed to be. 692 people on MIT this morning. 692? 692. Wow. That's almost half of the population. That's correct, because there's typically 1550. That's correct. Not counting the out of state population. 
when you said the oh not counting not counting the population but senator sears i do want you to be heartened by the, the following updates i can give you on that um, we'll be hopefully um, reviewing and looking at how to enact um, a substance abuse app on their tablets that comes from England that's a comprehensive, like, multimodalized treatment and prevention service. The recovery coaching is going to be get the well. we're about to expand yeah. that everywhere to a reentry group. So, and we're finalizing a process and coordination with the recovery network itself, whereby they're going to develop a site on their website so that anybody who voluntarily wants to have a recovery coach upon release will be matched up with a recovery coach in their area. Oh, good. And there will be a hot handoff um, and welcoming into the recovery centers themselves. I think Turning Point just did a big article in Brattleboro about that. Yeah. In the paper. So I've been working with the health department yeah. and Fawn Mark Montague there. And then we also are, Kim and I have a meeting later this week to discuss our other challenge, which is internal, which is space in the facilities. Um, we are trying to roll out um, a, an evidence-based co-occurring treatment group called Integrated Change Therapy that was developed by um, a Vermonter. Um, from this expert research. And so we're trying to literally find a space so that those groups can be statewide because we don't want to create geographic inequity by only offering those groups in some places. Um, but we are really well staffed, um, increasingly so, to deliver all the MAP support, uh, such as social counseling. Do, do you um, require such a, do you have <clears throat> adequate sex offender treatment in the community? I would say we're, um, we are down one therapist in Rutland right now. And other than that, we are we have a contract with every, in every area. What I will say is that that is an area that is extremely challenging to recruit for. Um, and we do have as, you know, most of the community has uh, yeah. an aging provider network. Um, so being very transparent, I am concerned about what the next three to five years brings in terms of our ability to continue to offer um, skilled intervention there. Um, I would be very interested in, in having a discussion, either in here or wherever, or even privately about how we provide housing as well as treatment to sex offenders because that's a group that appears to be over the maximum, over the minimum, excuse me, mm -hmm. can't be there if you're over max, or shouldn't be there if you're over the max. Um, so how do we provide treatment to that, to the, to that group and provide housing? <coughs> you know, I had a meeting with Pathways. They said, oh, we, we don't care if they're sex offenders or not. Talk to the people in Bennington. I have a, a number of tools who are sex offenders, but it's generally been a challenge to get them out of the out of facilities. And I want to talk to you sometime about pathways. Oh, okay. Oh. Good, bad, or different. Mm -hmm. I don't have any buy-in. Oh, I just want to talk to you about it. Okay. <coughs> about why they don't care if they're sex offenders. Or oh, not. anyway. Mm -hmm. um, that would seem to be a challenging area to, mm -hmm. to look at. Um, and I think also housing for people who have severe co-occurring is yeah. another huge gap. Um, as you know, the residences are either substance abuse recovery or more mental health inclined. And when you have both, which again, our population really only has both, there's just a cliff that you fall off of. Yeah. They, don't, they don't fit anywhere. And then everybody wants to discuss um, what diagnosis is primary and whether or not they'll take the secondary. And, and the, the part of the problem also, I, th I think, is that people who have the co-occurring, even, even if they are housed, even if they find a place, they have some kind of a relapse or a, and they lose their housing. And I've been talking with, um, I've been trying for years to get some kind of short term, I didn't know what to call it, but Mike Sherling calls it 
tune-up housing. Mm -hmm. You might need someplace safe and secure to go for a week, maybe a month, two days, and get retuned up when you lose it. And it would be cheaper for the system mm -hmm. to do it that way than to have them recommit and do whatever and then they end up back in jail or back in intensive care. So I, anyway, he's, he's right there. <coughs> okay. Any other questions or comments? Can I ask one question about, I know this isn't what you were supposed to talk about today, but um, did we create a mental health unit? Do we have, we talked about last year about Springfield, was there a, there's a section there, a new pod that could be done there? What, where are we? Okay, the update is this. At Springfield, we do have a full unit um, that operates as a mental health unit. The programming was developed and put in place at the beginning of the summer, ahead of the deadline. And we monitor that now as part of our daily practice. To the so, so I think some of the okay. confusion comes in the mental health people who are convicted of a crime and are in corrections population who have serious mental illness mm -hmm. may be dealt with in that mental health unit. Right. There's a other group of people who are <coughs> in a in a sense guilty by reason <coughs> but not but not guilty, not guilty by reason of insanity where we do not have a forensic unit in the state of yeah. Vermont. And that may be a place that You know, I, I don't know where we're going to go with that, but that's part of the problem. I think when a lot of conversations get confused about those two groups. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. In a recent case. Yes. yes. And do I, is it true we have about any at any given time about five or six of the of the not the, of the forensic, not not <coughs> the people who are in with serious. Because again, there's restoring competence, then there's, yeah, you know, there, there are a couple of different stages. Stages, and again, yeah, I get they could be in, in shared custody depending on what's transpired, or they could only be in the custody of DMH. Okay. In which okay. case, they may not, they deem that you know uh, middle sex is not appropriate, mm -hmm. and then if there's no new charge, which was the issue with the recent case, they can't be, unless somebody wants to recharge them with something, they can't be returned to the Department right. of Corrections because they're not in their custody. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. We'll continue the conversation. Nice Sorry, to see you again.